All right, so hello and thank you for attending today's session. My name is Casey Long and with me today is Christopher Bishop. And today we'll be talking to you about building asynchronous modules. Um, we'll be looking at the copyright module assessment findings and some recommendations that we have. So in 2016, McCain Library began construction of an asynchronous asynchronous module designed to teach students um, how to become responsible content creators. And by that, uh, we mean how to reuse works created by others and how to license their own work. So in short, this module has become known as the copyright module. And our goal in this presentation is not to describe the success of the copyright module, which we do feel it was successful, but to provide more of an understanding of what made it successful and what should be considered in the development of future modules. So we're very much looking forward to your feedback and, and rec on our recommendations and findings. Um, this summer, McCain Library plans to transform this module into six segments, individual segments that may be added into any course. Each segment will include an assessment and students will receive a badge upon completion of that segment um, and the completion of all badges all six badges will result in a master badge so students will be able to do things individually but if they get really excited about having a master badge they can do that by completing a few more modules and we hope that this approach will help faculty feel more confident in the incorporation of this skill set so um so the findings that we will present today are based on two focus groups that we did that had 10 students in it that took the course in fall of 2022. And um, we are also using to inform our recommendations, some of the feedback that we've received informally from faculty. So that's really just um, when we've been talking to faculty about questions they've had about the module while they're implementing it, um, we've incorporated that into our thought process. And also every single uh, semester, students were graded. Uh, there are two assessments that they were um, given. And we looked at those assessments. And from that, we were able to understand whether students were actually walking away with uh, knowledge of the concepts that we we're teaching. So that's really what's informing this, but we're going to focus mainly in on the copyright focus groups that we conducted this past spring. And Chris is going to tell you a little bit more about that. So Chris, can you tell them why we think this module was successful? So we, it? Knew, we believe it was. Uh, we had five specific learning goals that we started with, and we shaped everything around those. So that helped us to formulate and create the components of the copyright module. Um, and then also when we were doing assessment, we found that with the majority of students, we were able to meet our intended learning goals uh, with only one exception, which I'll discuss in a moment. And so as far as learning goals, um, the first was articulate the purpose and distinguishing characteristics of copyright fair use in public domain. This we felt pretty confident that students were able to do this for the most part. Um, the one area that we think that is a little problematic that we need to spend more time that we need to address in the future is going to be public domain. Um, students oftentimes overestimate what is in public domain and oftentimes would equate public domain with things that were like archival or things that were just publicly available. That was probably the only area though that we found from the learning goals that was problematic. Otherwise, as far as uh, the second seeking permission from the original content creator before using original ideas and creative works of others, that I think was probably where, and Casey tell me if I'm wrong, but where we found that students were probably most successful, they really seemed to understand that that was important yes, to definitely. do. And if they were not sure, um, they would find other ways. Um, and then give credit to original ideas and creative works used in the production of online content. Uh, again, there was a understanding that a, a credit needed to be given. Um, I think there was a misunderstanding beforehand that just giving attribution was uh, enough and that this uh, cleared that up. 
and so that was a good outcome. Um, and then licensed content posted online to provide clear guidance on how one's work may be used by others. Um, a lot of students weren't didn't really understand how to license their own work or the importance of that. And so students understanding how the Creative Commons license could be used and creating a citation for that, which would tell a user um, how how they could use the students work was was, I think, very enlightening and uplifting for students. And also, again, students just I don't think students always understand beforehand that if you take a picture and it's yours or it's a piece of your art or your writing that that is yours and, and you have the right um, to withhold use or define how that will be used by others. And then um, the last ones evaluate uh, providers of free images and other creative works before using material in one's own work to ensure the source is a reputable provider of usable content and that uh, the way in which the work will be used fits the parameters of the provider's terms and conditions of use. Again, I think uh, what we really found from this is that students now understand where to look for this information, whether it's a Creative Commons license that may be with individual images or creative works, or just going to a site like Unsplash, where they know that all of that, uh, all, everything, all the images on Unsplash are copyright free and can be used as um, a student would like to use them. So I think that again was one of the big takeaways and we felt really confident in the way that students understood that too. So again, just to reiterate, all the learning goals we felt really good about, we felt good about the feedback and the assessment. Again, public domain was probably the only one that seemed to be problematic. Yeah, and I would say that um, the students didn't master copyright, but they have an extraordinarily great start. Um, that will be um, put them farther ahead in their professional careers than most. And that was, it was interesting, that was a takeaway because I think we had to decide on, and it was a question that was being asked with, with the feedback from students, is what the ultimate outcome was supposed to be. And I think with a module like this, we really came to appreciate the fact that there, there's no way they're going to master this information in just a short amount of time. But we definitely feel like with those goals that they do have a much better understanding and that they're competent in these areas. But I think asking someone to master copyright, which is so nuanced, after a module, which we feel is pretty in-depth, but still that's that's asking a lot. I mean, there's, as we all know, there's literally lawyers who specialize in copyright uh, who would have an advanced degree, so. Um, focus group findings. So this is what we learn. What, what do we learn from students? This, for the most part, was their first experience applying copyright. Most, I think they have, we, we found that they had a vague idea about copyright, but again, I was talking about a, a lot of them had the idea that if they had some kind of attribution, citation, that that was enough. And so that was really interesting. Um, and also uh, something to look at as far as pretesting goes. And then time consuming, but not rigorous. We were focused more on the idea of this as being rigorous. But what we really found is that students found to be more time consuming because these ideas are so new to them and they were unfamiliar. So it was it was more so the, the amount of time they spent. And then also they thought that it was going to be more rigorous or more, more time consuming than it actually was, um, which feeds into intimidated by the length of instructions. We had very detailed instructions. We didn't want there to be any ambiguity. Uh, we'll talk more about that as far as instructions goes and some changes we would make. But the length of instructions was intimidating. But again, that was just to make sure, did they understand everything? And I think, well, we'll talk about that later. I got to make sure I don't go into the solutions. Um, appreciative of my multimodal presentations. They really liked the fact that we use slideshows, videos, um, PDFs. They really like the fact that, you know, if, if I'm more of a visual learner or I'm, I'm more of this kind of learner, they like, they like the differentiation there. So that was really important. They don't want just one type of, of mode of delivery of information. And then uh, information needs a clear and relevant assessment. That was um, kind of eye-opening for us and that basically students were saying that if information was presented but they were not being assessed that they did not really pay attention to it. And we thought we were being helpful by having these extra pieces of information that they could use. And it was definitely, they were very clear in the fact that if you do not assess us, we are not going to pay attention to that area. So that was uh, of little use to them. Um, 
And then the goals of the module, um, students were able to apply this to real world situations, but they definitely felt like they needed more context, a better understanding of why they were doing this. Although what we found is that they were able to apply it to real world needs. And so even when that wasn't clear to them at the beginning, by the end, they were able to understand why it was useful and how they should apply it. Anything you want to add up to that one, Casey? No, I'm good. Okay. Great job. Um, and then what do we learn as librarians? And, and I, I guess I'll just say here, I can't say enough, this focus group was so helpful to Casey and I, because we went into this with the idea that we knew there was going to be criticism, that we knew they were going to be critical. In fact, we didn't want them, and, and Casey alluded to this in the beginning of the presentation, we didn't want them to just sit there and go, oh, this is great. No, it wouldn't change a thing. We wanted them to be really critical, and they were. Um, as far as why it was successful, and I spoke to this before, but students understood that it was important. They were directly applying it to their portfolio, their schoolwork. And then for some, there was at least one student um, in the focus group who has a job that pertains to copyright and found it to be really helpful to understand these things. And I believe was something um, the student told us they were actively able to incorporate, but also I think even mentioned to the employer. Um, and then also that second bullet point, they're at a point, they're about to graduate, they have an understanding of the kind of schoolwork they've done, they have their portfolio, they're about to move into um, either graduate school or the beginning of their careers. And so again, it was a good point for delivering this information. Um, as far as the next one, confusion rather than empowerment, um, again, we, we thought there were things that we were doing that were helpful and they really weren't. Uh, one is that we tried to create the look and feel of the SUM 400, um, the, uh, the, the modules the, um, in Canvas, but then also with the uh, Google Doc in that, and we thought that was helpful and students found that to be really confusing and they did not care for that. They don't want multiple platforms. It's discombobulating for them. And then segments in smaller increments, we're definitely going to... Um, need to address that. There were some places where we would have an um, extended amount of information and then we would assess it. Students found that to be confusing. They want small chunks of information and then some kind of assessment to see how they understand the information and then to um, actually apply it. And then less instructions are better. I talked about that before, but with the instructions, again, we were we were really going on with a lot of detail and what we should have done. Well, we'll talk about that in the future, but they found less instructions better. And before we go into our Q&A period, based off of what Chris just said, I just wanted to kind of um, build on what he said about the instructions um, in the multiple platforms. This is what it looks like inside the uh, Canvas course. And so you can see that this document, it has part one um, with several steps and we're already on page two. Um, and then part two with several steps. Um, and each has links to other places, which um, will link you out to our LibGuide that will then um, provide the instructional materials. And then they go back to Canvas um, to do a cumulative assessment. So, um, and that's what it, it'll say down here, complete the week's assignment on Canvas, um, complete the discussion questions. And this may have worked well in all the other SUM 400s, but given um, students' lack of familiarity with copyright um, and a little anxiety for it, the number of instructions that we had just seemed intimidating to them, even though we have the learning outcomes there. We had originally designed it, this is a very rudimentary version of it. Um, so our, our modules look like this now. Um, they're very concise, but originally we had learning outcomes up here and the instructions embedded onto the LibGuide. And what we think might be, when we talk about multiple platforms, what we think might be most helpful in the future is when students are in their Canvas page that the link um, here just goes straight out to that LibGuide where it has the instructions. We really thought that there was supposed to be the seamless um, experience of when they were doing um, something that was similar to what they'd done in the past 
um, like the instructions for design and purpose, we didn't create that one, that our instructions needed to look exactly the same. And we really fleshed them out there. What we should have, if we're gonna keep with that pattern, the students should just have a link to the copyright module on the LibGuide rather than having the instructions there. So it could open up to a Google doc, but instead of having all this detail, it would say, please go to this website and complete the instructions there is what we think would be probably best. So just wanted to clarify that. Um, anything you wanna say about that, Chris, before we go into questions? I think the other point we, we, yeah, and just to add, is that students, oftentimes the questions that we would have were basically where it was pretty clear the student hadn't read the directions. Mm -hmm. And so basically we were reading through the directions with them and then pointing out uh, where that, you know, a resolution. It was interesting too, because oftentimes the students would say, oh, thank you for clarifying that. And, you know, you're kind of saying they're thinking, Oh, well, that's it's in the directions, um, which I think feeds into the idea that if we're if we have these very complex directions and students aren't reading them, we're just adding to their confusion. And if we have additional materials to help clarify, that's probably best or or and certainly they could reach out to um, KCRI to help clarify that, too. And we'll address those in our recommendations in just a moment, like um, we wouldn't do away completely with long directions, but there's a place for them. So I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording for just a moment before we move into our recommendations and see if there are any questions. All right, so thanks Chris for that explanation of our findings and we had a great Q&A session. Um, so now we're gonna talk about the recommendations for creating asynchronous modules. So based off of that feedback, what are we walking away with? And what you're looking at here in this um, bulleted list of a lot of text, um, contrary to what we think a module should be. Um, on the left-hand side, you'll predominantly see things that just are very, um, these are things that we basically went into the module doing. And I think it's, um, if anybody knows good instructional design practices, this is probably what you're already doing. So creating clearly defined learning outcomes, making sure you're breaking learning activities into smaller segments um, that state when students need to uh, be, what students need to be accomplishing that uh, segment. Um, we just found that students really need clearly defined learning outcomes. They want to know what they're about to do, how long it will take, and what they need to get out of the experience. Um, and we feel like this can best be accomplished by breaking the learning activities into these short segments, providing learning materials that are followed by an activity and then followed by an assessment. And we also feel like each segment should have an assessment. Um, we were in the past relying on a cumulative assessment of skills mm -hmm. so that we'd ask the students in the instructions, now pause and save your work. And we're not really sure how clear that helped them. So keeping the segments really short if you're not gonna be in an environment where you can actually provide students with immediate feedback, then um, that's gonna help in terms of the design of the module. Also keeping the activity instructions um, short and simple. We found that though some students really liked our detailed outline of steps to take, many of them felt intimidated by these instructions and felt more anxiety about the project. So um, it was a many of the steps that they had to do, we could literally sit in our office for 15, 20 minutes and work through everything with them together. Um, but it was the anticipation that this was gonna be a very difficult project that they um, usually kind of got stymied at. So we recommend that instructions be kept short and simple. If time permits, create more detailed instructions. Um, perhaps a link to those instructions should be provided at the end of a short set of instructions for those students that really prefer a more detailed outline. Um, and that, um, and that uh, each, each segment, oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, just have a, a link to it. I already showed you all kind of what we created before um, and that having the short instructions embedded on the 
on the site where the instructional materials are will probably help the students, but again, keeping those short and sweet. And then finally, um, incorporating slideshows, short videos, and informative graphics when possible and limiting text heavy documents or lists. So um, one of the things the students kept saying to us over and over again was, we love the videos, we love the slideshows. They were looking for something to go back to when they were doing their assessment um, to, or when they were practicing using the concepts learned that they wanted to go back and quickly be able to find the materials that address that issue. And they felt like with the slideshows in particular, that that was something that they were able to do very quickly and easily. So um, that's another element that we're gonna include in ours. Like I said, these are all design elements that were existing in our original design and are probably pretty well known as best practices. The second side of the slide lists some things that we kind of walked away um, being surprised about and learning a little bit more. One was the minimizing of the number of platforms. We talked about that earlier, um, just trying to reduce the number of uh, clicks that somebody has to go to to complete all the steps that they need to do. So when possible, keeping that in mind and trying to reduce that. Also leaving out supplemental materials. As Chris mentioned previously, the students, if they did not um, feel like it was going to be assessed, then they usually didn't read it. And we really were excited about some of those materials. Um, we felt like one of them was students being able to know exactly how to ask for permission. Because isn't that a question that you would ask if you just looked at a slide presentation of um, five questions to ask yourself to know if you need to ask for permission to reuse a work? Well, how would you then go ask for it? And Chris created a wonderful um, document, but we didn't do anything to assess them, engage them with that document or assess them on it. So nobody ever probably read it. And um, again, it added to the level of confusion or um, overwhelmness of getting as much material as they were receiving. So, so that's what we'll try to avoid in the future. And what we're planning to do with the badging is that we are going to take that um, component out and do it as a separate segment um, so that it's something optional for somebody if that's what they want to learn. Um, and that'll be part of the master badge. And also the copyright fair use segment, that was not given enough attention in this module. It was something that we felt like was really important to address because many students hear that term fair use all the time, but at the same time, it just complicated students' understanding of uh, some of the basic messages that we were trying to get across. And we didn't, we only assessed that in the forums. So, um, so we, in the forums, we didn't really always see everybody grasping those concepts quite as well. So those need to be their own individual modules. Um, providing a clear motivation for completing the modules. That's something the students did bring up um, that, and I think that they obviously did have a clear motivation to complete them because of the, uh, in the end, it was having to be the only module that they um, were required to do in some 400. But um, they definitely felt like, even though they saw the value in learning this material, that they overall, need to either have a grade, a badge, or um, a very compelling statement from somebody that they trust, like a faculty member that will talk about how it benefits them. So, um, so obviously we're going with the badging <laughs> as our clear motivation and faculty will probably go with a grade using those badges. And then finally, providing an opportunity for synchronous engagement when addressing complex topics. Uh, the real reason why we have to break this down into so many different components is that it is a very difficult, complex topic that has taken years for Chris and I just to learn how to talk about ourselves. So um, students, if they're going to be doing all of the components together, um, or if they need more context, there are going to be some students that need to have some sort of engagement with somebody to understand why are we really doing this? Um, what am I going to get out of it? Um, how do I, what are you asking for here? Um, and so we would like to, anytime we're developing asynchronous modules, to make sure that we time that with um, a synchronous presentation or an opportunity for students to have drop-in hours to 
go through it with an individual. So um, that is something else that should be kept in mind is that once you create an asynchronous module, you can't just disconnect yourself from ever doing in-person kind of engagements. They really ideally should be complementing each other and be connected. Anything else you would say here, Chris, before we move on to embedding them into the curriculum? No, I don't think so. Cool. And Sorry, for a second there, I thought I stopped. Uh, I hadn't started recording again. <laughs> All right, so um, one of the, the next points that we wanted to make is talking about embedding asynchronous modules into the curriculum. And um, there are very few prescribed methods for teaching a course at Agnes Scott. Uh, each faculty member takes a learning outcome and identifies the best ways to teach that in their course. And um, while this is, what makes our classes really engaging with students. It can also make it very difficult for creating asynchronous modules that will work with any course. So universal asynchronous material design is very difficult. And the modules can often seem out of place or the faculty member doesn't feel like they understand the materials. So um, as we think about designing modules, um, the designers themselves really need to think about um, bringing in all of the stakeholders. So um, taking the time, not just to prepare it for one class, but to think, is there any other way that this could be used? Um, and try to keep that in mind so that it's not just tailored to one assignment, but it has elements that can be easily uh, morphed to other assignments. Um, and everything can be changed with instructions, but the materials themselves, the learning materials should be constructed in a way that they can be used in a lot of different contexts. So definitely having those meetings beforehand with faculty and other staff stakeholders um, to design it. It can be designed for a specific assignment, um, but if that's the case, if something is designed and then there is a use that is identified for it, um, that a faculty member decides that they want to use it, but they weren't in on the discussions, rather than changing up the design of the module, um, the designer should really work with the instructors to design that assignment so that it fits around what the asynchronous module is trying to do rather than feeling like um, some sort of ad hoc piece that does not necessarily connect. So there's language that could connect the assignment to the module and the designers should be happy to work with the faculty, meet individually with them to do some con consultation on the assignment design. Not write the assignment, obviously, but just provide some guidance and feedback on how it would best fit with the module so that students will feel there's a seamless interaction. And then also we wanted to emphasize that um, instructors who are using the module need to provide the content to context for how it relates to previous course materials. So, um, Oh, and how it will help them in the future. So students really, one of the things that we heard from them the most is that they want a bridge that indicates how new information relates to what they've learned previously. And that um, when they don't feel like this is made, they can feel lost, they fail to make connections and they're really unsure what the goals are. So um, making sure that uh, the faculty seem invested in it um, and feel like seem like they know uh, what the students are gonna get out of it will make the students feel more confident that it is a valuable addition. And so, um, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this segment, um, I had mentioned that we had talked informally with faculty, um, but we really do feel like that's the area that does need more research if we're, we're gonna be continuing to create asynchronous modules here at Agnes Scott if it becomes a stronger part of our curriculum. Um, because the faculty members um, need to be able to share what their concerns are. We need to understand what designing assignments, what designing modules um, will best fit for their teaching styles and needs. So we, that's one area that we do recommend that we do additional uh, research. Chris, anything else you want to add? Oh, no. All right, so Chris is gonna share with you the final recommendations for the copyright module revisions. Okay, so as we've, we've belabored this point, but reduce the length of the instructions. Um, 
select one platform to host the content. Right now, it will be the LibGuides, and then we will probably use uh, Google Forms to do an assessment, but we're certainly open to other things. Um, we just want to limit the number of platforms, though. Um, embed assessment opportunities after each segment rather than assessing work produced over the course of three to five segments. That I, I think was probably our, our biggest takeaway here is that they've got to be in smaller chunks and it has to have the assessment needs to be specific to that. And in addition, since we're breaking these down into sub badges of a master badge, it'll be even more important that each of these are more self contained. Um, and we again, that's something else we'll address as we review and revise these is that everything that we do will have some kind of assessment. There won't be anything superfluous. Um, and then as Casey just spoke to this, but if a subject expert is not introducing a module, ask the instructor to teach the module to complete uh, the module so they are able to clear, clearly able to articulate the learning outcomes of the module to the student. And I think too, even though, and I know we've spoken to this, that students were able to understand why they were doing it and they had their own personal takeaways. I think for some students, if there was more context, more of an understanding of why, more connections with previous and work they would do afterwards, they would feel more buy-in. And I think sometimes, you know, with this, the idea is, um, oh, well, this should be, it should be clear to the student why they are. But students had to kind of figure that out for themselves. And we heard it repeatedly after, after doing it, students understood why it applied, but they definitely were confused in the beginning as to why it was of importance. So it was interesting how the student figured out what they needed to do, figured out why it was important, but maybe that would have helped in the beginning too. Okay. Well, um, that's all that we have for today. Um, we're gonna pause the recording in just a moment for questions and con comments. Um, and then this information will be shared out to both staff departments that create con instructional content that faculty may be using, and it will also be shared with faculty. Um, just so you know, the slide materials will be sent to you and the supplemental materials at the end of the slides just detail how the original copyright um, module was constructed. So what were the original learning outcomes and what was the rubric that was used for it? So we want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, my name again is Casey Long. My email is clong at agnescott.edu. Christopher Bishop is cbishop at agnescott.edu. And we're happy to meet and talk with anyone about these issues.